clown. Noun, a comic entertainer wearing a traditional costume and exaggerated makeup. For my entire lifetime, for your entire lifetime, possibly your parents, the clown has had a closer association with classic horror than the traditional make you laugh court jesters of old. Just a few years ago, they were all over the news. Reports of terror on towns across the globe spread like wildfire. For hundreds of years, the joyful, jovial, jaunty beings had their places in monarchal throne rooms. They would do their shtick before plays. They would march in parades, throwing candy to kids. Our traditional stereotype is derived from their appearances in traveling circuses. When and how did this invert? Today, clowns are a closer association with vampires or zombies than they are with comedians or entertainers. Is it their supposed childlike innocence? Because you know that can work both ways ways. Spend any time with any kids and you'll know that they'll match innocence with equal cruelty. Children can be monsters. Is it the makeup? It's unnaturally white, hides facial expressions. After all, there's nothing more unsettling than someone you cannot read. Fictional portrayals? Edgar Allan Poe once wrote a story about the old-timey medieval Joker who is coerced into getting drunk by his king, then retaliates by setting him and his fat friends on fire. Sweet Tooth, Pennywise, the killer clowns from outer space, Krampus, the insane clown posse. A villainous clown is nothing new. The Joker first appeared in 1940, modeling him after the jester from The Man Who Laughs, a 1928 horror film adapted from a French Victor Hugo novel from 1869. There is a long history of both good and evil clowns, though I'd wager the flip in our collective unconscious was grounded more in reality. Seeing as we don't have kings anymore, people don't go to plays, people don't go to the circus, as time has gone on, the profession of being a happy clown has fallen out of favor. By the time you get to the 1970s, television is in virtually every home. Why leave the house to go to the circus when you can see it at home? Greater media exposure also meant people weren't as easily entertained. Is this funny anymore? Throwing pies? Big red loud noses? I don't know if it was then. I wasn't alive in the 70s. It is the year 1978, and this is John Wayne Gacy, professionally known as Pogo the Clown. He's part of a diminishing breed, performing at children's birthday parties, marching in parades, handing out candy, in the makeup, the wig, the whole shebang, the whole getup. John has a secret. In the last six years, he has murdered at least 33 young boys between the ages of 14 and 21. 33! 33 murders, then buried them in the crawl space under his house. It was 16 years between his arrest and execution. A real life killer clown, given the lethal injection in 1994. The same year of Final Fantasy III. That's it! You people have stood in my way long enough! I'm finally going to talk about Final Fantasy. About an hour into the game, you learn everything you need to know about Kafka in one short scene. Thuy, Emperor Gestal's stupid orders. He's a complainer, and nobody likes a complainer. Nobody likes somebody who bitches and moans. Ahem, there's sand on my boots. Notice how he does not tell them to wipe the sand off his boots, as if the fact that the presence of sand on his shoes strikes enough fear into his underlings that it is understood what needs to be done. Then Kafka laughs, throws a guard out of the way before confronting Edgar. In this tiny, in this minuscule in the grand scheme of things scene, lays the groundwork for so much fantastic heel work. In the pro wrestling business, a heel is supposed to be the person you root against. They'll lie, they'll cheat, they'll steal their way to victory hitting people with chairs, knocking out the referee, abusing their opponents, pre-existing injuries to their advantage. Basically, traditionally, wrestling writers and bookers would create villains by simply having them do unsportsmanlike things. Villains have the power to resonate using a variety of techniques. The last game I looked at, Live Alive, directly puts you into their shoes, having you play through our eventual antagonists, Descent into Debauchery. That title was playing on our natural sympathy for humanized characters. They put the villain through some shit, you see that shit, you feel bad for him. Though Kefka is not human. As stated throughout, and even shown in this small interaction, even his peers are taken aback by him. Also, he's a clown. Clowns are unnatural freaks, 
who may or may not have dead bodies under their kitchen sink. Kefka is an asshole. The kind of guy who bitches and moans while doing his job. Somebody who needs to have his shoes polished and dusted off. His first appearance is a Terra flashback, stating that he practically owns her and offering encouragement to, quote, burn up everything. Kefka is a WWF, WWE caricature of the evil clown archetype. Every single time he is on screen, he is doing something to make you hate him. For example, a couple hours of game time later, he will poison an entire kingdom, killing almost everyone including the wife and kids of one of our controllable heroes. It is arguably the most villainous, most heinous, most graphic thing he will do. Though my attention drifts away from that and goes to the equally impactful work done to his character on display when Cyan and Sabin confront him. You see, Kefka is chicken shit. When face to face with our heroes, he turns tail and runs. You literally chase him and he'll throw soldiers on the pile of Cyan's vengeance. A noble villain would have fought with honor, not let you chase him around like a Tom and Jerry cartoon. Kefka is not noble. He will survive in advance by any means necessary. Further in the game, the Empire are using these things called espers to gain magical abilities. We see Sid working for the Empire in this fantasy, disposes of the espers humanely. They're stored in test tubes, and he shows a certain reverence to their power. These are living beings with towns, societies, consciousness, the ability to procreate. Sid respects that. Kefka just sucks them of all their power and throws them into the trash. Literally, into the trash. Kefka then uses Celeste's emotional vulnerability to stage an ambush at the Magitech factory. A classic, straight out of WWF, heel move. In other Final Fantasy games, our antagonist might be controlled by a greater deity, like the Cloud of Darkness, or Genova. It's a deflection device, one that does not exist here. Kefka is his own man, driven by a lust for power, which is why he seals his own defeat on the day of his greatest victory. Kefka is talented, sure. He'll become the most powerful being the world has ever seen, but he's a tool, he's a coward. And most importantly, he embodies the central theme of Final Fantasy VI more than any other character, the search for a purpose. Kefka absorbs all the magical espers and artifacts he can, conquers the world, is feared, respected, worshipped even. Yet in this time between the end of the world, as the game calls it, and our final confrontation, all Kefka has done is create this over-the-top mess, this garbled obstacle course for our heroes to overcome. A Kefka with nothing to conquer is nothing. He has lost all meaning. <laughs> Kill you? No, you. You complete me. And he could have killed them multiple times, but chose not to. People like to claim that Kefka is the villain who wins, but he doesn't really. Sure, he reforms the earth. Sure, he gets what he was after. Sure, he creates this monument to non existence. But he can't win because he doesn't know what winning is. If you have nothing to work for, if you're not trying to gain anything concrete, then how do you know when you're there? I take things away, but people keep rebuilding. Why do people rebuild things they know are going to be destroyed? Why do people cling to life when they all know that they can't live forever? I've eliminated all joy. Plants don't grow. Everything is chaos. Everything is destruction. The world is a miserable place. Yet in this nearly dead planet of ours, you've all found a reason to fight? Kefka, having achieved everything he wanted, has nothing left to fight for. His fire is gone. The sociopath we had gotten to know over the first half of the game is no longer home. It's clear from the onset, Final Fantasy VI Three. will be a tonal shift from the preceding titles. There's no prophecy, elemental orbs or crystals, there's a war, weird steampunk machinery, somber tones over a two minute, technically impressive, but still a two minute long walking shot.
Square has always done a great job placing the player directly into the action and into the shoes of our protagonist as soon as the game starts. Final Fantasy 1, as soon as you pick your names and classes, BAM! On the world map. 2 places you in an unwinnable battle, showing you how strong you'll need to become eventually. 3, a little less dramatic as you fall down this hole. 4, Two. dazzles with a morally questionable raid on a hapless village. 5 has a little more pretense, but... A meteor falls from the sky, and there's action fairly quickly. Skipping ahead to 7, who could forget blowing up the initial Mako reactor? It's not like Dragon Quest, where you start in a king's throne room, or with your mom waking you up on your 16th birthday, or trapped on a boat with your dad as a little kid. Final Fantasy always made it a point to get you a taste for blood as soon as possible. Three, Six, that's not the case. It's text, backstory about a thousand-year-old war of the Magi, magic going extinct, an empire attempting to bring that power back, then two whole minutes of walking, all of it set to this somber music. One of the main ideas in this game, which is easily taken for granted nowadays, is that there's no central protagonist. The player's point of view shifts countless times. Two, Four, saw characters rotating in and out ad nauseum. Cecil was always there to anchor the team. In fact, out of the 32 games I've covered in this series, the only one with a truly rotating protagonist was Live Alive. And that doesn't even really count because I cheated and did that title out of chronological order. Though actually Lord of the Rings switches protagonists about halfway through. It's really weird, you play as Frodo up until a certain point, but then control shifts to Aragorn, and Frodo just kind of stays in the party for the rest of the game. It's really strange. Terra is the first one introduced. She's on the Japanese box, but famously she's optional to finishing the game. In fact, she's only a required party member for the opening couple of hours, and then again for the Esper hunt about halfway through. We control Terra first, but make no mistake, she is not the main character. I didn't start this video with a five minute non sequitur about the history of people with bluish green hair. Or did I? No, that honor belongs to Kefka. Final Fantasy VI Three. is his story. Nevertheless, Terra is special. She's set up as the stereotypical chosen one. Amnesia, unique powers with no discernible origin. We play as her first. Later on, we'll learn her backstory. Terra worked for the Empire after being forcibly adopted by Emperor Gestahl as an infant. At some point, Kefka uses this device dubbed a Slave Crown to render her a mindless puppet. Unfortunately, this scram scrambles her brain, and after it's removed, she has no idea who she is anymore. With no memories, nothing to base a sense of herself around, she goes with the player because, hey, well, at least they aren't trying to mind control me. Terra knows only one thing for certain. She is an unnatural freak for having magical powers. Locke and Edgar hammer this home spazzing out mid-battle upon witnessing her magic. The Returners might be trying to use me for my special abilities, but at least they're being diplomatic about it, I guess? You're given a dialogue choice with Bannon, whether or not you become their, quote, last ray of hope against the Empire. It does not matter what you pick, as the story will proceed the exact same way, though it shows maybe this character has reservations. This whole war thing is new to her, maybe she doesn't want to be involved. Her state of mind worsens after it's revealed that she's a half-human, half-esper, half-freak hybrid. So you mix those together and now she's a super freak. Normal women look like this, but on a bad hair day, I'm not even human. Terra can go Super Saiyan now, sometimes not voluntarily, making her even more of a fetish object for warring factions to exploit. Final Fantasy VI is nicely divided into two parts, before and after Kefka's mass destruction. Fans like to refer to these parts as the world of balance and the world of ruin. I have no idea where these terms come from. I'm pretty sure nobody in the game says either one. So I'm gonna call them Wonder Bread and Crazy Bread from here on out. In Crazy Bread World, Terra loses her fighting edge, then opens up an orphanage to care for children displaced by the apocalypse. Only when these children are attacked by a demon, she can mother bear protecting her cub it away by going Super Saiyan. Uh-oh, Terra let her freak 
out in front of the kids, but instead of shunning her or trying to use her as a weapon, they just think it's really freaking cool. Tara, who really didn't give a shit about anything in Wonder Bread, does not know what love is, now has a purpose, a reason to fight in Crazy Bread, because, um, take a wild guess. She's got kids now. Two of her kids are even having a kid of their own together, okay? She's got a grandkid now. Celeste was one of the Empire's top-ranking generals, on the same level as Leo or Kefka. She's also the first character we control inside of Crazy Bread. Like Terra, she worked for the Empire and could use magic. Key differences being Celeste was artificially infused with magic and was presumably a willing participant. Terra was born special and then kidnapped. Celeste signed up. She also has some kind of built-in morality. As the Empire's conquest tactics grew harsher, more rigid, severe, she becomes a Benedict Arnold to the Empire. Or does she? It's up to interpretation whose side she's on inside Wonder Bread. Locke finds her, supposedly just before she was to be executed, but if that were the case, why would they welcome her back with open arms shortly after? Inside the Magic Tech factory, she leaves with Kefka and is introduced as a general of the Empire during the Returners and Empire's temporary truce. She clearly doesn't follow Kefka, as her actions in Crazy Bread would prove, though she may have been loyal to the Emperor. One of my favorite dynamics, source of tension in the entire game, is this awkward boat ride between Terra, Locke, Shadow, and Celeste after she abandons them in the Magitek factory. Sure they've called a truce to find these espers, but she apparently has betrayed both sides at this point. Celeste is the centerpiece to by far the most famous sequence in three. Three. And one of the most recognized scenes in the series to this day. As part of an elaborate plot to trick their way onto an airship, Celeste, with no input of her own by the way, stars in this world's equivalent to an operatic Romeo and Juliet. The lyrics mirror her story arc. She's the darkness, where the stars. She tosses the flowers the same way she tosses herself off a cliff or not. She may or may not actually do that depending on how well you feed Sid. Two sides, she's caught in this crossfire. In Wonder Bread, she's divided. In Crazy Bread, she's the great uniter. She's the dipping sauce. Being the first character you control, it's her job, it's her role to get the band back together. She knows what team she's on now because she's met someone who can accept me for what I am. That's someone being Locke. In Wonder Bread, he keeps his dead girlfriend preserved in the basement? He couldn't protect her, so he's overprotective to both Terra and Celeste. Despite both of them possessing the ability to tear him apart, normal, well-adjusted people don't hang on to their past so literally. Keeping your dead girlfriend as a keepsake is FREAK behavior. In Crazy Bread, he actually finds a way to revive her, but it only lasts a few seconds seconds, wherein she tells him to grow the fuck up and move on. Those are the main ones, but finding a purpose, moving on from your past, these themes extend down through the whole cast. Sometimes, literally, Cyan manages to get two separate physical manifestations of his grief. A ghost train taking our dead to the afterlife, including his wife and kids. He boards it, but there's nothing he can do about it. I always admired how at the end of the sequence, it just sort of ends with a moment of silence. You're in full control of Sabin, but nothing's interactable. Cyan just kind of dips his head and the game allows him, allows you, to take in the moment. Then later in Crazy Bread, his baggage comes back in the form of Larry, Curly, and Moe. Yes, seriously, they even call themselves Stooges. They're whispering negative thoughts from the inside. So you go into his psyche so he can realize that his family lives inside him and not these Stooges. Shadow failed to protect his friend, then abandoned his kid. Reconnects with her, sort of. He doesn't tell her, but at least he doesn't slit her throat for a nickel. Gao is abandoned by his dad, then realizes that his father is a piece of shit and he's better off without him. Sabin runs away from one succession crisis directly into the arms of another, and learns that none of that crap matters. Mog? Uh, well, Mog is just plain cool. Everyone pulls an inverse Kefka. Instead of going from this energetic force to the lethargic nihilist, instead of learning that nothing matters, our cast learns that people matter. Anyone with motivation issues before came to the opposite realization in the end. It's the day-to-day -day concerns, the personal victories and celebration of life and love. And that allows them to find joy 
in this almost dead world of ours. You know, it's taken about 33 episodes to finally get to a game that people care about. When people hear every Super Nintendo RPG, when you hear Super Nintendo RPG, you think of Chrono Trigger, you think of Earthbound, you think of Final Fantasy III. And I imagine a lot of people saw the concept of my series, clicked on my channel, maybe skimmed through the playlist, and they're like, hey, I wonder what this guy thinks about Super Mario RPG. Oh, he didn't make that video yet? Well, I get to finally check one of the big ones off the list today. Final Fantasy III Six. represents the lessons learned from the beginning to now. So what exactly have I learned 33 Six. games in? For starters, in terms of production value, technologically getting the most out of the Super Nintendo, no other developer comes close to what Squaresoft was able to accomplish. You can say that other companies have made more mechanically interesting, that they lend more of a flavor, that they made more unique games, but in terms of the art, the craft of making a video game, Square was as good as Nintendo at the time. And that's high praise. Nothing else popped quite like Final Fantasy 3 or 6 three. off the screen. Gorgeous looking game. Incredible decision to use characters' battle sprites through the entire game. 4 and 5, they had Final Fantasy 6-esque detailed sprites, but only inside battle. Everywhere else, they were scaled down. And when you hold those games up to three. 6 side by side, it just looks chintzier in comparison. It's one of those things that you really only notice in hindsight, but once you do, you wonder why the older Final Fantasy games were like that. The Mode 7 overworld is incredibly eye-catching. Enix, Chunsoft, Almanac, Koei, Atlas, HAL, Intelligent Systems, Capcom, Data East, FCI, Falcom, Neverland, Infograms, JVC, Chemco, Interplay, Bulletproof Software, and Culture Brain sure as hell didn't make them like this. None of them put as much time, thought, and effort into their games. No other company would have given us this many set pieces, assets, planned cutscenes. That's something that it might sound silly to point out. And if you're only playing the big famous Super Nintendo RPGs, it may be a given. Of course the game's gonna have cutscenes. What the hell do you expect? It's an RPG. But I've played through games with three Six. different locations and zero cutscenes, where everything is just dialogue boxes, and they stretch it out the entire runtime of a video game. Final Fantasy VI giving you new things to chew on visually constantly, believe it or not, was almost wholly unique. Whereas for almost every past game except, I guess, Dragon Quest V, I could recommend that if you wanted a fulfilling story or a great plot, then you should pick up any book, literally any book, it doesn't matter. Go to the library, close your eyes, feel on the shelves and grab a book, and it'll be more... You'll be better off for having read that book than you will have for playing any of these RPGs. And I actually used to do that, by the way. I used to go to the library and close my eyes and feel around for books. Um, I read a lot of... I read some interesting stuff that way. That's how I read the first Twilight book. I just happened to grab it. Um, I read a book about what it's like the month after you give birth to a child. Um, I read a book called Bonfire of the Vanities that I really Really liked it's one of my favorite books the last unicorn i read that anyway final fantasy Six. 3 aside from dragon quest 5 i suppose is or maybe the shin megami tensei games at least in america it's the first time where i can't say that because it holds up that well on its own it represents sort of a transition for both final fantasy and really jrpgs as a whole for one it was the first game not directed by series creator sakaguchi which probably explains the shift in tone from more of a saturday morning 
morning cartoon vibe to a Saturday evening cartoon vibe. They wanted to create a game with as many central protagonists as possible, and as a result there's 14. Narratively, I believe they spread themselves a little thin with this. As many others have noted, not every character receives equal treatment. Though as a counterpoint, I will argue, the characters which are not as fleshed out oftentimes make up for it by just having a cool design and a neat personality that you can glom onto anyways. Like having the player control a Moogle? A Yeti? Some guy you find inside of a giant worm? Why the hell not? These guys are cool. At least they're memorable. Plot-wise, this feels like the first Final Fantasy game that wasn't just made up as they went along. What the hell was 5 about again? I barely remember. There was a tree that, like, came to life, sent his disciple Exdeath, or maybe Exdeath was the tree. I don't know, a tree was pissed off about the humans exploiting the world for its resources. It's really strange, and Square wasn't ready to tell an environmental story like that. At least not yet. Three. Six does not have that same quality. Sure, you may forget some of the details over time. They might erode, but the overarching set of events... I'm not gonna look back in two years and struggle to remember what happened in this game. When you're trudging through the snow, you get the sense that when that scene was laid out, the developers knew you would end up in that crazy bread world. And you know what, let's talk about that real quick. You should not be surprised as a veteran Final Fantasy or even a veteran RPG player, that something similar to that was going to happen. If you've only played the preceding Final Fantasy games, after receiving the airship, you should know, it should be obvious that this can't possibly be the entire game world. At this point, it was a tradition for Final Fantasy games to have more than one overworld. Three had the floating continent and the regular planet, I guess. Four had an underworld, and then you go to the moon, that's another world. Five had Dimension X, or whatever whatever the hell they called it. I honestly have no idea. I don't know, but you go to a parallel world. I don't know, man. I barely remember anything about five. So when six Three. has the crazy bread world after Wonder Bread, it's like, yeah, okay, this is the second overworld I've been waiting for. Makes sense. Of course, how it happens is still, if you haven't been spoiled, it's a hell of a moment. Centering its story around the rise and fall of our villain was another fantastic decision. And it sounds simple, almost so simple that what was the point of me pointing it out? But so many games don't do this. Have your antagonist A, be involved in the story, and B, have him be the biggest asshole possible at every opportunity. I compared it to pro wrestling because they used the same techniques. In every wrestling match, in every scene involving Kefka, both the wrestlers and the writers of Final Fantasy asked themselves, how can we make this guy act in the worst, most dickish way possible? Which is different from having him do blatantly evil acts. It goes all the way down, it extends through his character so thoroughly that just little things like having him constantly complain about his job make you hate him. The battle system is absolutely nothing special. It takes after five, but instead of having your characters study different classes to gain abilities, they're now swappable, equipable items you find. Narratively, I like the Espers. I like the purpose they serve. It's a game about these 14 different people that have juiced up on this unnatural power, taken down one, like, super jacked up dude. What I appreciate about the battle system is the secondary abilities, not the magic. Everybody has their own pet special command. Some are more useful than others, but what's incredible to me is that they all serve as extensions to their own personality. Setzer the Gambler has a slot machine. Terra, as mentioned before, can transform into her Esper form. Locke the Treasure Hunter can steal things. Classic RPG trope. Thief steals. The Yeti is constantly in berserk mode. You can't control him, he just attacks every turn. Realm, the artist, can make paintings of people that does their attacks back at them. Edgar, the more civilized brother, uses technology, while Sabin, the more rugged, uses martial arts. Even outside of strict plot involvement, Final Fantasy VI's developers were constantly trying to think of ways to make each character stand out. Juggling 14 party members is no small feat, especially when you're earning Honestly trying to tell a story instead of just having them be faces in a plot that doesn't really matter, like in Fire Emblem or in Shining Force. Now I'm not normally one to speak on a video game's music because I don't know anything about music, but Final Fantasy VI Three. has some great tracks. The kind of things where after you're done playing you'll find yourselves humming or whistling them to yourself. And you know what? Yes, it does use the L word. It uses the L word a whole lot. It uses the L word pretty well. But I'm not going to talk about it because 
fucking... I wish YouTube would just shut the hell up about the L word already. It seems like every other gosh darn video game analysis video has like half of its runtime devoted to talking about the L word and how it's this masterful use of like... No, it, like it's not. Just stop pretending that it is. You'll learn about the L word in like fifth grade music class. It's not anything groundbreaking. It's not anything spectacular. Yes, it's in this game. Yes, they do it well. <coughs> But let's not pretend like that's why this is the best shit ever made or anything. To conclude, Final Fantasy Six. 3 is not only the culmination of every Final Fantasy game that came before it, but a culmination of every JRPG that has come before it. This was the new standard, the measuring stick, that everything would be compared to. Well, at least for three years it was. If you've played through it, do it again. Maybe get the Pixel Remaster. If you haven't, it's mandatory playing. Get on that. Don't think that just because I spoiled the game for you here that you're not going to get anything out of playing it yourself because there's tons of stuff I left out. If you're geeky enough to be hearing my voice right now, you're geeky enough that it's expected that you should have already played through Final Fantasy VI. Three. So if you haven't, go out and rectify that. Right now. Anyway, that's all I got. Never trust anyone who needs a haircut. Goodbye.